next time worry comes, you tell that evil spirit of fear it doesn't get to live on God's throne. And you take that same energy. Come on, some of us are using way too much energy on what could go wrong and the worst thing that could happen. And we're reading Google way too much and not his word way too much. And it's time we start saying, my worry is enthroning something, so I'm cutting it off. And I'm gonna worship where I would have worried. Wrong thing. Galatians chapter five, verse number one. I'm switching it up. I got a lot of verses here. Galatians five, chapter one. It says this. It is for what? It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Period. It is for freedom that Christ broke you free of death, hell, in the grave. Christ had no other purpose than to make you free. Christ didn't set you free for you to be bound. Christ didn't set you free for you to live in fear. Christ didn't set you free for you to struggle through depression for the rest of your life. What kind of meaningless, purposeless life is that? Christ set us free for freedom. That's what he said, not me. Because if I were to write it, I would have said, he set me free until the next event that made me bound. That's what my feelings tell me. That's what my situations tell me. But if we're going to operate not by sight, but by his word, we're going to declare over our life, Christ didn't set me free for me to be bound one more year. Christ didn't set me free to have, a, have these chains on my heart and my mind. Christ didn't set me free so I could be walled up again. Christ set me free. He didn't set me free for me to be partially healed or somewhat healed. Christ set me free for me to be fully healed and delivered in Jesus' name. Remember, Christ didn't show the disciples his wounds. He showed them his scars. They were changed by his scars. Touch my scars. This is where the wound was. The wound says, I know what it's like to hurt. The scar says, I know what it's like to hurt, but I also know what it's like to be healed. Christ didn't set you free to hurt for the rest of your life. He set you free so you could be healed, so that you can become the ones bringing in the hurting and the broken, and you can be fully free. Here's the question I have for you. What does your life look like without fear? What would you do if you had no fear? You know, I believe the devil's greatest fear is a church without fear, a people without fear, God's sons and daughters without fear. Because without fear, you have unlimited faith. You have unlimited access. You have unlimited power. You have unlimited purpose. You have unlimited destiny. I believe that God is rising up in these last days a fearless church. See, a scared world needs. And there's some reason why you came to this place. Because you believe somewhere down in the corridors of your soul that God has called you to be fearless. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Then he says, period, stand firm then. If Christ set us free, we're not going to have to do anything, right? <laughs> nope. Wrong. After Christ set you free, it's not the end. It's the beginning. You haven't passed the finish line. You've joined the starting line. If Christ has set you free, then stand firm. And do not, what? Let yourself. Well, no one was there to hold me back from it. No one told me to go the other way. No one was there to encourage me. No, no, don't let yourself, don't let yourself, take all that power that you've been putting in all your worry and save it. Take all that power that you've been playing in all your depression and save it. Take all that power that you've been crying over yourself and save it and put it in your superpower, which is being free in Christ. Don't let yourself be burdened again by the yoke 
of slavery. Did you know that Christ can set you free and you can go right back to the very thing he set you free from and put yourself back into the same cage he sets you out of? If, if you don't know that, you haven't been a believer very long because most of us have gone back to the same cage like a dog returning to its vomit over and over and over and over again. Well, I'm tired of the sick cycle. I'm ready to break the cycle in my life for my family, for my house. And I believe there's a whole group of people that is sick and tired of being sick and tired. Yeah. It's time for a change. Yeah. It's time to move on. It's time to say that's my old location, but I'm not just going to leave there. I'm burning it down and I'm going to take that same ground. See, true repentance is not just leaving where you used to be. It's burning down the old house that had you captive and taking the soil and building a harvest there. I'm going to take the very place where I was bound and it's going to be my testimony. It's going to be the thing that challenges the world that they can move on and be more than they were called to be. Stand firm then. Don't burn yourself again with the yoke of slavery. You know what the Bible says? When you've done all to stand, stand firm. Stand when you've done, I've done everything I can to stand. In other words, when you get to the end of yourself, allow Christ in you to keep standing. Yeah, the Bible says to be, to have your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. The shoes they were talking about, as, as Paul would have wrote that, he wrote it while being chained to a Roman guard. The shoes he would have been talking about were the shoes of peace, were the shoes that they used to fight in. They had about a three-inch spike on them. Did you know that, that, that true peace has spikes? True peace is dangerous. True peace isn't the calmness of the day or a beautiful sunny day. True peace is when the storm is raging. And you can be fast inside of the shelter of his hand, of his love. True peace looks like those shoes that dig themselves in and say, I will be unmovable. Not because of me, but because of what God has given me in his peace. The gospel of peace that God has a firm foundation for me. When you've done all to stand, stand therefore with your feet ready with the gospel of peace. What does that mean? What's the gospel of peace? See, we think that Christ came to just destroy the works of darkness. He came to be a go-between. See, it wasn't darkness that was really going to destroy me. It was God's holiness. So Christ came and stood in the gap of my sin and my missings of the mark. And he took the full brunt of the Father's holiness. You say, well, God, that's mean for you to be that holy. Well, fire is hot and it's not going to stop burning. I'm thankful that it is hot. I'm thankful that God is holy and there is nothing else in him except for his holiness. So Jesus came and he was the peace offering for me. He took my place. He didn't just die for me. He died as me. And so I can stand here firm today knowing that he was good enough for anything I walk through. I can have peace today because he is my peace before the Father. If I'm okay in the Father's eyes, I don't care whose eyes I'm okay in. And fear has to leave. Fear has to leave. Come on, say it again. Fear has to leave. Today, I encourage you to switch your fear. Have such a fear of the Lord, an awe of the Lord, a reverence to the Lord that everything else has to leave. See, in life, I've learned that when you have an awe for God, you enthrone him. The Bible says he is enthroned in our complaining. He's enthroned in our worry. He's enthroned in our worship, in our praise. So your worship enthrones the Spirit of God over your life, puts him on the throne, puts him as Lord and ruler. So your worry also enthrones something. Both your worry and your worship enthrone a spirit. Because here's what I've learned is that fear is not just an emotion, it's a spirit. The Bible says in 2 Timothy, the Bible says, I'm sorry. Yeah, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of, it doesn't say for God has not given us the emotion of fear. It says God has not given us a what? Spirit, spirit of fear. You say, what's the difference? Well, an emotion is something that's a part of you. 
A spirit is something that's attacking you. You need to realize that that feeling you're feeling is because there's a spirit trying to destroy your life. You have the feeling, but you are not carrying that spirit because you have the spirit of God in you. And so we're gonna declare war, not on the feeling of fear, because to remove my feelings, I would have to remove myself from this world. But we're gonna declare war on the spirit of fear because the spirit of fear is trying to take God's throne in my life. God has not given you a spirit of fear and timidity, but he's given you what? Power. Power. Love. Come on, Tony, I hear you. And he's given you what? Come on. And what? Come on, this is the kind of church that talks back. Come on, he's giving you what? Power. He said, you get three for one. The enemy's gonna attack you with one weapon. I'm coming, I'm giving you three to attack right back. And here's what I'm giving you. Against the spirit of fear, I'm giving you three weapons. Everybody say three weapons. Power, love, and self-discipline. We know he gives us power and love, but we forgot the self-discipline part. God said, I'm going to do it, but so are you. I'm going to do it, but I'm going to empower you to be as, as big as me. I'm going I'm to give you strength to conquer some things. I'm going to give you power. Power, this is this same word right here is the same word that happens in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit shows up in power. You will be clothed with power. And that word in the original language is dunamis, which, which is the same word we get dynamite for. God is going to give you dynamite power. If you've got, you got a mountain you've got to get out of the way, what do you use? You use dynamite. You can use bulldozers all day, but there's a certain point where you need some explosive power. I'm telling you what, the power that God gives is the kind of power that moves mountains. You say, I got some mountains. Good news is God gives you supernatural power through miracles to break chains, to bring down walls. If you got a lot of things that have been built up from fear, good news is God's got you power. How do you tap into that power? I believe you tap into it through prayer. I believe prayer is a supernatural key. Keep this verse up. It's a supernatural key to deliver us from fear. Some of us need deliverance from these demonic forces called fear that are riding on our life. They have entrance through trauma, through open doors. Some of us need to shut doors we've opened on accident. Maybe a movie you watched. Maybe something that happened to you as a child. Maybe something you did. Maybe something you didn't do. Maybe something that happened to you. And over and over again, you have all your walls built up, but you're leaving a hole right there. They yeah. say, well, I'll just leave that alone. No, no, you got to go back to that place and you, and you got to remove all the extra and you got to say, okay, Holy Spirit, I don't even need you to build a new wall here. Why don't you build a wall of fire? Why don't you build a wall of fire in my childhood? Why don't you heal me in that place, that broken, that hurt moment? Why don't you show me where you were when this happened? See, I've had to go back to moments of trauma in my life through prayer and say, all right, Holy Spirit, show me where you were when I went through. I remember, you know, I just had to go to North Carolina on a plane. <laughs> I hate planes. Everyone knows I hate planes. I'll tell you every week, I don't like planes. And so somehow, I don't know how it worked out, but, but the first class ticket was the same price as a regular class ticket. So somehow I got first class. They don't tell people that. I'll tell you that. That's the favor of the Lord right there. It took a while to receive it, but I'm receiving it. Usually I got that poor man's first class called Southwest, amen. But they've been canceling those flights, so I got the new man's first class on American. And I, and I, I said, I am American. Come on, give me the. They said they have the lay flat beds, and I'm all excited. I'm like, man, I'm gonna be bougie on this thing. I'm gonna get every, I'm gonna ask for every peanut they have. I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat all the almonds. I'm on a fast, so we ain't getting the meat, but come on, God, look, give me some of that tofu. And, and, and you know, I'm, I'm in there. And, and for, as soon as we walk in there, I got my seat. And guess where my seat was? In the middle. I don't like sitting in the middle. I like to see out the window. I like to know what's going on. I like to be in control. And it, I kind of got a witness out there. And then not only was I in the middle, and the two ladies on the outside don't like to, some people don't like to look out, so they keep the windows down. I need to see. These two ladies keeping the windows down, I'm 
rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And, and then I notice that the, the chairs are backwards. So I'm sitting there and I'm going, God, I'm not only having to fly right now, I'm going backwards. And God said, well, I guess the author of Declare War on Fear is going to have to get through some fears today. <laughs> God's not giving us a spirit of fear. But just because God's not giving us doesn't mean the enemy's not trying to give it to you. And so you're going to need these weapons. You didn't need to get any power. You're going to need to understand that God has given you superpower. And, and, and so I've learned that prayer is something that helps me. It's, it's a weapon that I have. And, and, it, and it, it will calm me down because prayer brings his presence. Say that with me. Prayer brings his presence. I remember I was a youth pastor and I was about 23 years old. Can you picture me 23 years old? <laughs> Spiky hair. Didn't, I just, I was just so, I, you know, if you think I had a lot of coffee now, you should have seen me then. I mean, and so some of our team is still a part of that that is here today. And we had this youth ministry and I, I love teenagers. I love uh, junior hires and teenagers. And I just long to, to set our whole city on fire for God. We lived in this small town called Modesto. And, and so we had all the, trying to get all the high schoolers and uh, just trying to show them how amazing the God of the universe is and how much he loves them. And, and I'll never forget, every time we would do something, our church would grow and then it would shrink. I mean, I did crazy things. One time I had this idea, let's bring a giant pool in the church. And I'm going to do a front flip off a speaker into the pool with a sword. That's what I did. I didn't tell Christy. She's like, oh, you know, and I actually punctured the pool and it went everywhere. I almost got fired. But thank God Christy's dad was the pastor. And so I couldn't get fired. He knew he'd be putting his, his daughter out too. One time I actually lit the church on fire on accident because I was like, I'm preaching about the fire of God. And so one of my friends, he was kind of crazy. He said, let's go to Walmart and I know how to light yourself on fire. So we went to Walmart. Whenever you go to Walmart for a pyrotechnics thing, it's not a good idea. I know that now. I was 23. I didn't know. I lit the whole church on fire. I mean, come on. It wasn't supernatural. It was physically on fire. <laughs> but every time our church would grow, it seems like the next week it would shrink. And I kept coming out. As many of you keep coming out with your business, keep coming out into your family, keep coming out into the call on your life. And I would come out and it was more depressing than I wanted it to be. There were less people there. I was preaching to empty seats with a few leaders that were super on fire and a couple of kids that were making out in the back. That was my service. <laughs> Hope we still have that back there where I can't see. Amen. Just put a ring on it. Amen. There we go. I remember walking out to end worship and I just looked up and my eyes, my natural eyes saw what was there and I was so sad about what I saw because I felt like, God, I, I just can't do this. All that fear and that insecurity and all those things from childhood just overwhelmed me and I just walked back into my office on the other side of that wall and I remember just sitting there crying and they thought I was like, oh, God's moving, let's let it keep going. I was like, God's not here. Like, I don't know what's going on, but, and I remember being in my office and I just started beating on the wall with the drums. It was like, almost like I had this picture in my head that I was beating on God's chest. Have you ever had to beat on his chest? Can I tell you he's big enough to handle it? I remember beating on his chest. And I remember after about 10 minutes of beating on God's chest in the wall, I was like, oh God, I have this dream and I don't know why it's not happening. I have this hope and I don't know why it's not coming to pass. Why am I still here? I don't know if you've ever been there. Why am I still here? One more year here. I'll thank God for a new year. Guess I'll have to drag some old dreams out. Well, those didn't happen, and those didn't happen, and those didn't happen, so why even dream anymore? I remember beating on God's chest. And he said, Jeremy, I could hear this in my spirit. Are you done yet? Are you done yet? Are you done with all your ideas? Do you need one more pool? I'm going to teach you how to light yourself on fire. Do you have any more creative ideas? Because as soon as you're done, I can start working. I said, God, I am so done. I am so done. I have no more ideas. He said, good. 
Because when we're done, you're not going to get the glory. I am. I said, okay, God, what do you want me to do? He said, rip up your sermon. It's not that good. <laughs> I had a sermon on paper, and I had stolen it from T.D. Jakes. Actually, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> T.D. Jakes preached it. I was really good at preaching T.D. Jakes. I could even do the get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Slap your neighbor with a knee, a weave. Come on. I, I was really good at T.D. Jakes. And people were like, what's wrong with this guy? I think he was born in the wrong body or something. No, I was just copying T.D. Jakes. Favorite preacher. And I had a great sermon, and God said, rip it up. I said, okay, God. So I ripped it up. And he said, when you go out there and grab the mic, I'll tell you what to say. Not a second sooner, not a second after. So I'm like, all right, God, there's only like 10 kids out there, so I think we'll be okay. So I went out there, and as soon as I grabbed the mic, I heard the Holy Spirit say, invite everybody on the stage who's sick. And I said, but God, they didn't teach me that part in Bible college. I don't pray for sick people yet. I haven't graduated to that level of pastorship. On the stage, that's what like, Crusade evangelists do. And God, there's no sick people here. This is youth. They're not sick. <laughs> and God said, okay. Do you want to run this youth ministry? Or do you want me? I said, okay. I'm done. And so I said, all right. Anybody here tonight that's sick? Come up to the stage. And I'll kid you not, guys. Like half the crowd came on the stage. I looked behind me and they couldn't even fit them all. The band was moving out of the way and there was like 30, 40 kids filling the stage. A kid in a wheelchair. I never even seen this kid. I was like, okay, if I knew that the, someone with a wheelchair was coming, I would have upped my faith, but Lord, okay. And then there was a kid with a growth, a kid with a cast on, someone with something on their neck, some kid bent over like that. And I'm like, all right, Lord, okay. What do I do now? He said, pray for them. So bold, fearless Pastor Jeremy went up to the first kid in a wheelchair, was the first person. I'm like, you could have started with that guy that says he has eczema or something, but. <laughs> and so I just put my hands on his legs and I begin to pray. The kid began to yell about a couple of seconds in and he goes, your hands are hot. Your hands, and I'm like, oh, I think it's working. I think it's working. I think it's working. Guys, get it. I mean, isn't it funny how your heart will tell on you that you didn't actually believe till you're like, oh, wow, <laughs> Lord, I believe for this. I know this is true. It's happening. I said, okay, stand up. The guy stands up. I'm like, okay, maybe he could stand up. I don't know. Uh, can you walk? I've never walked. Okay, let's try. This kid starts walking across the stage. He's completely healed of a disease he had since he was a child. The first kid, one after the next, after the next, after the next, was healed in front of our eyes. Growths are disappearing. People are saying, oh, they're trying to rip off their cast. I'm, people are pulling their glasses off. I'm like, all right, Lord, this is wild. And we're all celebrating. The band's going. How many guys know I didn't have to coach everybody to worship that night? How many guys know I didn't have to, I didn't have to beg everybody to know God is big? How many guys know that everyone was like, wow, this God we've been worshiping is an amazing God. Everybody that night gave their heart to the Lord. We all just said, God, we love you. People that didn't come up, came up at the end. Can I get healing too? As I was walking off the stage, the Lord said to me, he said, did you like that? I said, God, that is the kind of youth group I could pastor. He said, good. That's my youth group. Since you resigned and I'm leading this, here's what I need you to do, employee, for the rest of the week. I want you to pray instead of work. Now think about this if you're an actor out there. Here's what God tells you. I don't want you to go to any more interviews. I want you to pray all week. Think about this if you're a businessman. I don't want you to do any of your staff meetings. I want you to gather them and pray. Th think about what God is telling me as a pastor. And I looked at God. I said, are you kidding me, God? Like, I work here. I don't know if you know I'm the youth pastor here. They, they pay me to do a job. I go to staff meetings. I counsel people. Do you know that, God? And God goes, oh, oh you're telling me at the church that you work at, you can't pray to the God that's the head of the church? 
Like you'll get in trouble? He said, then maybe you should get in trouble and leave this church. I said, oh, okay, God. I said, what do I do if someone needs a meeting? He said, have them come in, pray with you for an hour. If they still need a meeting after that hour with you, then meet with them. I said, okay, God. So three kids needed a meeting that week. So I told them, hey, come in. I'm just praying eight hours a day. They're like, eight hours? I was like, yeah, I don't know. I've never done it, but it's my first time. <laughs> I said, can you come at this hour and you can just pray with me? If God doesn't answer your pr- what you needed in the hour, then I'll meet with you after. Guess what? I never met with a kid that whole week. I don't know if they just got tired of praying or if God touched them, but either way, I didn't have to meet with them. I probably would have made them worse anyways. All week long, I was praying. I never prayed so much in my life. I said every word I've ever said since I was two. I, I, I laid in positions and on the ground. I worshiped to songs I had never heard. I got to the deep tracks of Misty Edwards. I don't know if you know who she is, but there are some deep tracks there. And, I, and I'm just like, this is awesome. I've never, you know, and, and I was just in God's presence and I didn't tell anyone. Somehow, somehow God did it. The next week came around and I didn't have a sermon because I didn't study. I didn't have time to listen to Jake's. I just was listening to the Lord. And so I got up there with my microphone another week and I didn't know what God was gonna do and a whole sermon came out, a whole message. Some kids were like, that's the best sermon we ever heard. I see them on the edge of their seat. There's a few more kids there that week because how many of you guys know when someone gets healed, they are the best flyer that could ever leave this city. They're the best billboard. You know, someone that gets healed from a wheelchair is gonna tell somebody. You know how they're gonna tell somebody? They're gonna walk like this. And people are like, why are you walking? I didn't ever see you walk. Well, God healed me. He changed me. He delivered me. He saved me. So that week there were more kids there and I remember just getting up and being so excited and God moved. I could feel his presence the whole sermon and teenagers, they stopped making out. They were focused. They were wanting to be there. (laughs) I'm praying this for you. And, and, And so at the end of the service, a young man ran to the altar and I thought, wow, God, people are running to the altar. Well, this young man ran up to the altar and he came about right here and he had a hood on and then he flipped his hood back and he looked at me and I kid you not, there was like this demonic face that I seen jump out of his face at me. I'd never seen that before or since. Face jumped out at me like a scary movie and then it went back in and he went down to the middle of the aisle. He grabbed a random girl and he starts dragging her out of the room, like foaming at the mouth, manifesting this is a demon. And so I had never, they didn't, they, we didn't have a demon class in Bible college. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do. I, oh, okay. Uh, and everyone's like, okay. This guy is literally, and so I, I didn't know what to do, so all I knew what to do is to close my eyes and cry out to the name above every name. And I started declaring, Jesus, Jesus. Instantly, this young man from the back of the room was at my feet and he's grabbing my shoes on his knees and he said, stop saying that name. Stop. And guess what I didn't stop doing? (laughs) Jesus. And I took my hand and I put it on his head and from his knees, he flipped backwards and landed on the ground backwards. And he started squirming all over the ground on his back. We're all tripping. This is before iPhones, we're all tripping. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, all right, what do I do next? And he goes, this demon is trying to rob me from my glory. He's trying to take the light of what I was about to do. So he said, have him go out of the room and have your associate pastor go out with him and deliver him. And so I was like, oh, praise God. (laughs) So I told my my part-time associate pastor, say, hey bro, can you take this guy out? And I know you're good at that. Hey, man. (laughs) So he said, but when he got back, he was so scared. He took him out. Guys foaming at the mouth. He put him in a chair and he said, instantly the demon came out. He gave his heart to the Lord. He was drunk. He became sober and he started praising God in the back of the room. That kid got saved that night. That night, Everyone gave their heart to the Lord. I said, guys, I told you it was real. I even got saved. I I, I was like, hey, Lord, just in case, just in case. I don't want that. And so, so as I'm walking off the stage, God says, did you like that? I said, no, I didn't like that. But I'm so glad you're with me. So glad you're with me. And he said, then pray another week. I said, another week? So eight hours a day. About the third day in, my secretary 
I noticed her lights were off in her little cubicle area and I peeked out the door. I heard some loud Misty Edwards. And I said, what's she doing? I looked out, she was praying. I said, well, I didn't, no one got me in trouble so I can't get her in trouble. So she just started praying with me. Then two days later, a couple of her students from her home group showed up and started praying with her. They're standing out in a circle. There was the most beautiful thing. I had done everything I could do to get teenagers to pray. And I, all I had to do, how funny, is just pray myself. <laughs> then the next day, a couple more showed up. By the end of the week, before Wednesday night, there was over 130 kids in our offices jammed in, crying out to God on behalf of their city, on behalf of their school. From that moment, our youth group kept growing and growing and growing and growing. In fact, in our youth service, in the building we had, we had to have two, we were one of the first youth ministries to have two services in a night, and then we were turning away kids. We couldn't even fit them all in the building, and then God said, ask your pastor to switch with the main sanctuary, because there's only 20 old people in there, and it holds 2,500. So we we told our pastor, said, Pastor, can we have the main sanctuary? And he said, you know what? I want to give it to the youth. And so we started praying for 40 days and 40 nights of youth. We went 24 hours a day and we packed out that main sanctuary that first night. It kept growing until God called us to come here. And that's what I'm believing for this place, that God would do what only he can do, but it's not going to come through might or through strength or through wise words. It's going to come through a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. And God has not given you a spirit of fear, but He's given you power. But it wasn't the power that I fell in love with in the room. It was what comes after the power is His love. My Bible says in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love. It cannot exist. That's why when you get in His presence, everything fades away. Because whatever you brought in, the oxygen is sucked out in the fullness of His love. It was in that room that I found out that God didn't care how big my youth group was. It was in that room that I found out that God was not trying to get me to get his approval. I already had it. It was in the room on the ground crying out to him that I discovered that he loved me at zero. He loved me at broken. He loved me at trying to do it myself. He loved me when no one else would. It was in that love that you get a whole new perspective. I would say this way, love lifts. I remember being on a plane one time and there was a storm and lightning and I had the window open. I was looking out and we're going through it and it's bumpy and oh, we're gonna have a keep your seatbelts on and turbulence and all this stuff. And there was this moment. And I looked out. The shutter I had closed because of the dark clouds and there was the sun. I thought it wasn't sunny 10 seconds ago. Where'd all the turbulence go? And I realized that it was there. It was just now beneath me. See, God's love wants to lift you to a whole new altitude. So although the same old thing is there, it does not infect your environment the same way. See, God wants to lift you above that dark cloud that's over you again. God wants to lift you through his power above because we're above, not beneath. We're the head, not the tail. And God lifts you above and then it's still raging, but you're not afraid of the rage because the sun is still shining. There is no fear in love. There's a story of a World War II pilot that he got in his old plane and as he's flying, he heard some, that some rats had entered the plane and there was a rat. He looked back and the rat was chewing on a wire. He's like, oh, they're gonna take the plane out. So you know what he did? He put on his oxygen mask and he pulled up. And he went to an altitude that took the oxygen from the rats. And the rats died, not with his hand touching them, 
but at the altitude he subjected them to. I don't know what the rats are chewing through the cords in your life, but if you realize that this is a spirit and your hands are too small, what you got to do is you got to climb higher. You got to put your oxygen mask on and say, there is no fear in love. So if fear is aboard, I'm going into the atmosphere of love. I'm breaking through, not, not, not love based on what I do. Agape love that has no limits or no borders or no barriers. Unconditional love. I'm flying into your love. I'm going higher today. Because in that higher place, you give me a sound mind. See, some people think, I have a bad attitude because I always go through bad things. I think you're always going through bad things because you have a bad attitude. It's time to get a new attitude on the bad things that are happening because you can't control what happens to you. But you can control how you happen to it. And it's time to choose today that no matter what we go through, God, I'm gonna praise you with my broken bones. I'm gonna praise you with the last breath I have. It's time we say, God, power, love, and a sound mind. Let the sound in my mind echo the sound of heaven. Let the sound of heaven echo in my mind. See, the angels aren't depressed. The angels aren't anxious. They're declaring, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. And I dare you right now, right where you're at, to declare war on fear and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. All my finances are filled with his glory. All my brokenness is filled with his glory. All my workplace is filled with his glory. Oh, come on, it's time to take off. It's time to go higher. It's time to go higher. It's time to say there is no fear in love. So if there's fear, I've been flying too low. There's fear, I've been flying too low. I was made for higher altitudes. It's time to go higher. It's time to break through the storm where the lightning can't touch you and the wind can't turbulent you. It's time to go higher. Come on, I don't know who I'm talking to today. I don't know who's tired of being thrown around. I don't know who's tired of being subject to the elements. I don't know who's tired of the place they're at, but who's ready to go with me to a higher ground, who's ready to declare war on fear. Come on, if you're ready to go higher, I want you to lift your hands. I want you to lift your hands right there where you're at. God, we need... Fearless Online Church, man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19:17 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, pretty much the modern day uh, version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending in a sense to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more no matter how much I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their heart so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? We wanna give out more clothing. We wanna give out more food. We wanna to touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out four million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today 
Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life. That love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're gonna partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the Fearless Partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are gonna sow into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with us today. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. We hope that it blessed you and we hope you have an incredible rest of your day. God bless.